Hello plant people, Nora the Lekker Queen here. Welcome to my Q&A session. So I will be answering all the questions that were asked on my Q&A post. And I just wanted to talk to you guys about how I've changed that. So before I used to have it as a weekly Q&A and I quickly realized that, you know, it was way too many videos thrown at you in a very short period of time. So I decided to make the Q&A session a fortnightly session. So bi-weekly session, and that means I get to answer as many questions as I can instead of just picking the one question. So I hope that works out well for most people. So I will be answering all of your questions that were asked on that post. So we will jump straight into it. So the first question was asked by Angela Kemp. Hi, Angela. So she wants to know, um, hello, Nora. Do you, how do you know which plants to grow on a round moss pole and which ones to grow on a plastic back moss pole? Okay, yeah, I get this question asked a lot actually. What's the difference between a round moss pole and a plastic back moss pole? So basically a plastic back moss pole has got this plastic sheet at the back of it. So it's got that, that's a plastic sheet and that is a normal round moss pole that doesn't have the sheet at the back. Now. The plastic sheet, in theory, helps to retain moisture in the moss, not even in theory, it actually does. So the, moist, the moss stays moist a lot longer than just on the pole that doesn't have the plastic sheeting, but it also helps direct the roots down because sometimes roots start go through the moss and just start growing in wayward directions. So the plastic sheet acts as a barrier and the roots start to grow down. So that's the thing. So how do I know which plants to put up on a plastic sheet? So I've got this varicosum growing up on a plastic sheet. She looks gorgeous. She looks lovely. I think she really looks pretty. And it's really just an issue of what plant I want to look pretty because I think the plastic back sheet pole looks a lot more professional. It looks so much nicer than just the normal pole, which is this. So I think that looks nicer than this, but that's just an opinion. So it's got nothing to do with the plant or anything like that. It's just personal preference. I just prefer to have the pretty looking plants on a plastic back moss pole, but also making the plastic back moss pole is a lot more involving than making a simple moss pole. First of all, it's a bit difficult to get the plastic backing as I'm sure a lot of you have found out. So A, having that plastic backing material and then you have to cut it, you have to cut the, you know, the mesh to go with the right size of the plastic sheeting. It's all a bit more involving. Whereas if you're doing a simple moss pole, all you do is just wrap around the thing and it's all done, Bob's your uncle. So Angela, it's just a matter of preference. It's just, I like the look of the plastic sheet backing. I mean, keeping the pole moist is neither here nor there. You'll have to moisten it anyway. So that's not really a major thing for me. It's just that I like the pretty look of the plastic sheet backing. So there you go, Angela. Next person is AM. 12294. And AM 12294 wants to know what my day job is. Um, they say, are you a teacher or an educator? You explain things so well. Oh, shucks. Get out. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. That really, thank you. Thank you so much. That really, really means a lot. It means I'm communicating what I'm trying to communicate to you and you understand what I'm trying to say. And that's all I've ever wanted. I always, I just enjoy the process of teaching. I enjoy the process of explaining things to people and having them be able to do for themselves what I have instructed them to do, if it makes sense. And no, I am not an educator, nor am I a teacher in my day job. I'm very, very far away from that. But thank you for thinking that I am because Teachers and educators are among the most important people in our society. You know, they form the backbone of everything. And I adore those guys. I couldn't do their job. I don't know how they do it. They are just awesome, awesome human beings. So shout out to all the teachers and educators out there. And I am so honored to even be remotely considered to be in your great company. So thank you for asking that question, AM12294. Next one is from Tiffany Burgess. 
Tiffany would like to know, um, as a frequent traveler, how easy is it to manage plants in Lekka? For example, if you're gone for eight days or more at a time, would you recommend a semi-hydroponics setup? Hmm, very, very good question, Tiffany. Would I recommend a semi-hydroponics setup? Yes, yes, I would. Um, but of course, first I would say it depends on what kind of environment you're living in. It depends on the environment that's available in your home. Does your home get very hot? Is it very dry? Do the reservoirs dry out really quickly? What kind of plant are we talking about? So for example, I know spider plants just drink, drink, drink. So you have to be on top of their reservoirs because they just drink up the water like this. Whereas other plants, you know, like Hoyas, for example, do not exhaust the reservoir as much. So it just really depends on your environment. I'll say that as a start. I've got my plant here. I've got my alocasia. This is my alocasia scalprum, and that's living in Lekka, and that's living in this reservoir. So normally my reservoir would actually be covered to prevent algae. And if you haven't seen my video where I talk about algae in semi-hydroponics, just click on the link above and that'll take you straight to it. But I left this uncovered just so I could demonstrate to you. So as you can see, this plant is living in this setup. The reservoir is over here, right? So just below the third mark, okay? So the roots of this plant are nowhere in contact with this reservoir. When I pick that up, you can see there's a root there. So well away from the reservoir. Now, I can tell you for a fact that in my home, in my environment, this reservoir will keep for at least a week. So that's seven days straight up. That's seven days knowing that my plant is not dry, seven days knowing that my plant is not drowning, and seven days knowing that my plant is receiving all the nutrition that it needs. Now I say seven days. Now this is seven days as a minimum. It can actually go longer and you can keep your plant for longer. What you don't want to do is just top up your reservoir so high that your roots are in touch with the nutrient, then you'll risk root root. So you don't want to do that. So maybe, you know, if you travel for a pretty long period of time, maybe instead of getting, putting your plant in a small pot like this, maybe you might consider putting it in a bigger pot. So the roots are further away from the base of the pot and you can have a larger reservoir. That's, that's one thing I can suggest, or you can have someone come into your home and top up your reservoir. That's another thing, but definitely having a bigger pot and filling up your reservoir a bit higher is better. It's, it's obviously not ideal because as your reservoir is evaporating, the pH in your solution changes, but it's still better than having your plant being dry and it's still better than having a plant die. So I hope I've answered your question in a way. So that's, that's kind of what I would do, but that's definitely one of the things I love about semi-hydroponics. The fact that you've got that independence, that your plants can basically take care of, your, of themselves, you know, and um, seven, eight days, you can even go nine, 10 days. It just depends on how high your reservoir is and how deep your pot is. So that's something you can try and experiment with Tiffany and I'm sure you can find a system that works for you. Um, yeah, I would definitely highly 100% recommend semi-hydroponic setup for a frequent traveler. Okay, who's next? We have Real Kitchen Diva White. Oh, I love that name. Real Kitchen Diva says, um, hello, Miss N. I recently purchased heating pads for a plant project this spring. I put one under my mama and stare at Sarah. I noticed that she really loves the heat. Of course she does. Plants grow in a tropical environment. They love heat, heat, heat. So she would love that. Um, the air roots are growing longer. The area roots are growing longer by the minute. I have four other small monsteras in Lekka. Have you put heating pads under plants in Lekka? Any tips or warnings? So yes, I do have some plants that I use for heating pads, uh, that I do 
use a heating pad for. So this is my heating pad here. Of course, every home needs to have a heating pad. And I primarily use my heating pad for cuttings, I have to be honest. Um, there's very limited real estate in my home, so plants don't have the luxury of sitting on a heating pad. Heating pad real estate is for precious cuttings. So I've got my varicosum that I chopped up. So that's the same plant that I've got living on that plastic backed moss pole. I've chopped it up and I've got the cuttings there and that's because I want a fuller plant. So I've chopped it up. So that's some of the cuttings there. I've got them living in a Clonex clone solution and I have that sitting on my heating pad. That's because I want it to be extra, extra warm and extra, extra propagating. I also have a larger um, silver cloud that I'm propagating as well. I'm not, actually, no, I lie. I'm not propagating that. I'm using the long method on that. So this plant was living in soil. I've now put it in a Clonex clone root zone special source solution. And that is living on a heat pad to get those roots going and just to get the plant exactly where I need it to be. So would I put a plant on a heat mat? Yes, I would. Depending on how hot your heat mat gets, maybe you might want to put just a little cloth on top just to dampen down the heat a little bit and to keep, to keep your solution from getting too warm. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would try it. I would try and see how you go. Try it with a less expensive plant if you want. And then, you know, the only way to find out what works in your home is to actually try it. It's all very well and good for me to tell you, but I don't know what the conditions in your home are. So just give it a try and see how you go. Thank you for that question. It was a good one. Next is Mason Matthews. Mason would like to know, um, hey, when you make your moss poles, do you soak your moss first? or do you make it with dry moss? Do you think either one is better or makes a difference? Thanks for that question, Mason. So, um, moss poles, moss poles, moss poles. I've got some sphagnum moss here. This is dry sphagnum moss. When you touch it, there's bits of moss that go everywhere. They just go everywhere. They're so annoying. So yes, you do have to dampen the moss just to control the amount of moss flakes that you'll have flying everywhere. So moisten it down, dampen it down to get it nice um, sticking together and then you can make your pole. But yes, I do. I, so for that reason, I do dampen my moss. There's another reason I dampen my moss. I normally dampen my moss in my GT Clonex clone solution. So this is what I use to aid rooting. So I dampen my moss with this because I reckon that, you know, there's some residue of this that's left in the moss. So as the plant is climbing and the area roots are coming in contact with my moss, they're in contact with those rooting agents and it helps them root better. Um, I don't know, it's anecdotal on my part. I just think it can't hurt, so why not? So instead of just dampening the moss with water, I use my Clonex clone solution and yeah, that's what I do. And it works for me. So there you go, Mason, thank you for the question. Next question is from Eve Craft. Eve asks, can you grow any plant in Lekka or are some not suitable? Do you have any plants that you tried in Lekka multiple times but just won't grow? Hmm. This is a tricky question because I haven't tried all plants. That's the first thing. So I can't say yes or no, that would be a lie. I will tell you a few experiences that I've had. So. My ethos is that any plant can grow in Lekka. That's what I'm trying to do in my practice. And so because I believe any plant can grow in Lekka, every time I grab a plant, I grow it in Lekka. So far, things have gone really, really well. I haven't had any plants that won't grow in Lekka. Now, the question is, do I have plants that do not continue to grow when they're in Lekka? That's another question. So I've got, I did have a maiden hair fern living in Lekka. So that's my maiden hair fern over there. And I got this plant and you know, maiden hair ferns have got the tiniest, thinnest leaves you could ever think of. They're so annoying. Um, so it's really, really very difficult to get them to grow 
in Lekka, to actually plant them in Lekka. But I did get a plant and she, I had her growing in my grow tent, all the moisture I could give her and she did really, really well. She started growing, she was lush and she was so beautiful. But she did take a lot out of me. I was having, I was literally babying her 24 seven. And I got to the point where I was just like, I can't be bothered anymore. And I just decided I wasn't gonna deal with her drama. And I just stopped caring for her and she's now in the bin. Um, and that, that's on me. That's on me. It's not on the plant whatsoever. But then I also think it's got to do with the size of the leka. So I think plants with smaller, smaller, a lot finer root systems need um, smaller bits of leka. So I know in, I've seen micro leka in America. I haven't really seen it here, but then again, I haven't really looked very hard. Uh, so maybe something like micro leka could work better for a plant like that. But yeah, I just found um maiden hair ferns i guess maybe ferns and i haven't tried another fern since i tried the maiden hair fern but that particular one i found a bit difficult to sustain in the long term it did grow and it looked beautiful but long term i was just like i just can't deal with this i needed my grow tent for other things so having said that about plants with very very fine root systems i do have about four African violet and the African violet has a very, 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 very small, thin root system. I'm not sure if I can, you know, show that. Hang on. I don't know if you can see that very well, but the roots are very, very fine. Very, very fine indeed. And I've got three of them. They're all huge. Look at that. This is the best my African violet has ever looked. I have, I've had African violets in soil since I was 12 and I have never had a plant look like this. They flower for me, they're living in Lekka and they're doing so, so well. This plant was actually living in soil and I transitioned it from soil to Lekka and look at it. This one and two of its friends are just loving life. They're living in the normal size Lekka. Their roots are as thin as a violin string but they're happy. So, you know, I don't know. Plants are just weird. You know, you just have to try it. Try it. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, I move on with my life. Life is way too short to be dealing with maiden hair fur and drama. Next question. We have Carrie Sprague and Carrie wants to find out, how do you find out about the plastic backed moss pole? And did you lose any plants in the process of trialing them? How did I find out? So, all these things, most of the things I talk about, I am not reinventing the wheel, guys. I just find all this stuff out from other people, give it my own spin where I can and voila, plant care. And you know, I went to Instagram. So when I started um, my plant journey and decided I wanted to get really, really serious about plants, I figured out the best place to find out how is Instagram. That's when I got an Instagram account and I started really following people who looked like they knew what they were doing. And I started just ingesting all that information and I came across a moss pole and that just blew my mind. I started growing, I started making moss poles. And then I came across um, a moss pole that had a plastic ba a backing and I was like, what the heck is this? Oh, oh, okay. And there are actually some people that actually, you can find commercially produced ones. Uh, but I didn't want to spend money buying something that I could make for myself cheaper. You know what I'm saying? So I went and I found out how to make it. Someone else helped me on, on the internet and they were like, oh, you do that? And you're like, hang on, that's right. So I went and I made one. And when I first made my moss poles that have plastic sheet backing, I actually had, you know, the head of the cable tie, I had them like this. And when you look on the internet, when you see a lot of people who've bought these commercially produced uh, poles that are like this or have made their own moss poles, the heads of the cable ties are hanging out like that. Now, of course, that's going to damage your leaves and that did damage my leaves. And I didn't, you know, it just never even crossed my mind. But this lovely fellow on the internet told me, oh, by the way, you need to, you know, change the direction of your cable ties because that's going to damage your leaves. And I was like, oh my God, yes. So, you know, 
everything I do, I find out from other people, I put my own spin on it and I give it to you guys because my whole point is someone told me, someone helped me and I wanna tell other people to, you know, to learn how to do all this stuff properly. So yes, the internet is your friend, Instagram is your friend. So instead of, so instead of watching reels of dancing monkeys or watching reels of people dancing with their plants, I look at um, posts that are educational, posts that are actually giving me information and help me become a better plant parent. So it's all about seeking information and using that information and most importantly, imparting that information to others. Okay, so Lorena. Lorena Martinez writes to me in Spanish and Lorena would like uh, to know about area roots. Lorena says she loves my videos and she's motivated to grow her plants in Leca. Yay, yay, Leca. And she would like to know what to do with her Monstera area roots. Monstera area roots growing all over the place. I hear you, Lorena. Monstera area roots are just crazy. They go everywhere. So this is my Monstera Thai constellation. And these are the roots. So you've got that, 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 that. They're everywhere. So do you want them to go back into the leka? Yes. You want them to go back into the medium. So it's either you've got a moss pole that you're tucking them into or you're sending them back because those area roots are, you know, they will go and absorb nutrition and your plant is going to be better for it. But look at this crazy girl. She is just crazy. This Monstera is just going nuts. Anyway, so yes, you do want to tuck your roots in and just not have them flying everywhere because those roots are going to do wonders for your plant and you want to use them. They've developed, use them to give your plant more nutrition. So thank you for that question, Lorena. Next question is from Pauline Thompson. Uh, Pauline Thompson asks, do I recommend putting a peperomia in Leca? Because Pauline just bought a peperomia. Do I recommend a peperomia in Leca? I'm pretty sure you know the answer to that. Pauline. Yes. Heck yes. 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 I will show you a peperomia that I've got living in Leca and you are going to love it. I promise you. This is my watermelon peperomia living in Leca. Living in Leca. Loving, loving. Look at that thing. Look at it, look at the leaves on that. It is, it's loving, loving life. I'll show you the pot. So she's living in a 14 centimeter pot. Very, very thin leaves, uh, roots on the peperomia, very, very tiny roots, but she's thriving. See, that's, that's roots there. She's got some roots coming out from the pot there. So that plant is, is loving life. And she drinks, she drinks a heck of a lot. And she's just, she's growing and just growing, growing, growing. I cannot wait to see what she will look like in a year's time. She will be massive. So yes, Pauline, put your plant in Leca and it will love you for it. Next question is from Leah Watkins. Leah Watkins says, when is the right time to add more water to your plants in Leca or Pon? Should you leave the vessel empty for a couple of days or add the water right back as soon as it's out, especially with Hoyas? I was adding water right back in or adding water before completely dry and it rotted. Please help me understand how to add water. Thank you. Okay, Leah, watering in Lekka. Now that is the subject. First of all, I'm sorry to hear that your Hoya died. That's just, that's just rude. That is just rude. I've got my Hoya uh, public calyx splash here. And uh, yeah, Hoyas do have delicate root systems. They're not as delicate as Peperomias or African violets, but they're quite delicate. So I don't know if you can see the roots on there. So what I do, and that's the reservoir. So what I do is I put my reservoir up to the level where the roots are just above 
the reservoir. So you've got your reservoir here and you've got your root system there. Of course, the water is going to start going down as it evaporates and as your plant utilizes it. What you really don't want is your reservoir to be dry. Because if your reservoir is dry, it means your leka is dry. And if your leka is dry, that means your plant is getting dry. So you don't really want to have a situation like that. So as I described earlier, what you want to have is a situation where there's always water in your reservoir. So if, so for my Hoya, I'll give you an example of how I take care of my Hoyas. So I will top up my reservoirs for my Hoyas and have them all at the optimum level just be, you know, underneath the level of the roots. I'll have them there. So for example, I do that on a Sunday, right? I will leave those Hoyas. I will not touch them at all until maybe the next Sunday because A, I have a life. I am quite busy. I have three children. I have a job. I really don't have time to be taking care of Hoyas 24 seven. And if the Hoya can't take care of itself in semi-hydroponics, then it's going to die. And that's one reason why I use semi-hydroponics. So I've put the nutrient solution in on a Sunday. And on a Sunday, I come and look at the Hoyas again. In most cases, that nutrient solution is not evaporated completely and there's still actually nutrient solution in the reservoir. On a good day, when I'm not too busy with children's activities and driving people places, I will take that Hoya and get the reservoir, throw out what's left in that reservoir. And the reason I'm throwing it out is because as the water has been evaporating and as the plant has been utilizing the nutrients and the water, the pH in that solution is changing and is not as optimal to nutrient absorption as it was when I first put it in. It only stands to reason that it's not going to be the same. So you want to change it over. You don't want to just keep it in there and just top up. Topping up is a last case scenario because, hey, again, you know, we have lives. I don't know about you, but I have a life. I don't have time to do this every weekend or every other weekend. So most times I actually do not change over the water for my Hoyas every weekend. I don't. I might top it up only, but even that is not ideal, but it's okay. My plants are doing well. You know, people aren't dying and nobody's getting root rot because let's be real. It's about how plant care fits into our lives. So on a good day, I will change that water over. On a bad day, all I will do is make sure the reservoir is not dry and top it up, up until it gets to a level where it's slightly below, below the roots. And that works fine. Sometimes I will even go a month without changing the water over and all I'm doing is just topping up. But you do get to a point where you do need to go and flush out that lecker, wash out the reservoir, check the roots and put fresh solution. So all I'm saying is ideally you want to change over the solution every week or two. If you can't, top it up. Make sure that your reservoir is not dry. And then ideally you do want to wash out your reservoir at least every month and flush the lecker. Just put the plant under a tap of water, clean it off, check the roots, remove any dead roots, put everything back and everybody's happy. So that is how you would manage your plants in Lekka. And if you do that, your Hoyas shouldn't die. I, I, I've, I've, in my practice, I've found it's very difficult to kill a Hoya in semi-hydro. I've killed maybe two, no, one. I've killed, I've had one Hoya die on me in semi-hydro. And I personally think that there was something wrong with that Hoya. I have over 55 Hoyas. So I'm not taking the fall for this one. I think there was something wrong with that Hoya. So yeah, no, Hoyas are not difficult to take care of in semi-hydro. So just make sure that those roots are protected from that nutrient solution, change the solution over and you should be right. I'd love to hear how you get on with your Hoyas. Let me know. Thanks for that question. It was a good one. Next one is Ali K. And Ali would like to know if I have a philodendron moyoi growing in Lekka. No, I don't. There's so many plants I don't have. There's so many plants I'd love to have. 
um, yeah, I've definitely looked at that plant and I'd like to have it and it's on my wish list, but not at the moment, I don't. Next question is from Gonara Valnieva. So Gonara asks me the most important question of this Q&A session, I think. And this person says, hi, Nora, why not Leka 100%? Why are you still using soil? Do your giants, giant pothos grow in soil mix? Why, why, why? Uh, thank you for that question. Now, take a seat, grab some popcorn, and listen to me rant about soil. First question, why? Why do I not grow 100% in soil? So, when I started my plant journey, obviously I was growing my plants in soil. I wanted to get better at it. I wanted to explore ways of getting better at taking care of my plants with my busy life. I found that once, you know, COVID was over, I was getting back to work, I was getting back to dealing with the kids. I didn't have all weekend to take care of my plants like I did before. A lot of my Hoyas were doing really, really badly. I had lots of leaves dropping off because they were tiny and the plant was dry and I started exploring semi-hydroponics. But by that point, my plants in my very, very big plants, my very, very big poles were already huge. I could not just physically manage to get the plant out of the pot and transition it to Lekka. Just the pure physics of it was just not possible. So the big poles I left alone. I changed everything over. My bird of paradise, I switched to Lekka. My huge Monstera, that Monstera back there was living in soil, I changed that to Lekka. Pretty much every, every plant I saw that was still living in soil in my house was transitioned to Lekka. I could not deal with soil. So I'm very much going towards 100% growing in Lekka at this point. That's the pathway in which I'm going. So all my plants that are living in soil and are living on a moss pole and are huge, once they get to the top of the pole, I am going to chop off the plant and I will be donating the bottom plant of the part of the plant that's living in soil. I will be getting that out of my house and the top part of the plant, I will be putting that in lecker. So I'm definitely an advocate for 100% lecker. I did do a video a few weeks ago where I showed people how to make an aeroid mix. And that's only because a lot of my subscribers were asking me what mix my plant was in. But, and you know, I felt in good conscience, I couldn't not tell them because my plants were are living in soil, the big, big poles. So I thought I need to show them what mix I use and how I put that up. But that was just for that. And I will tell you a little secret actually. In that video, I pot up a uh, golden ivy in soil and I demonstrate how to do that. But when I turned my camera off, I promptly got that plant out of the yucky soil and I put it in Lekka. I'll show it to you now. So this is my golden ivy that I put, that I used as a demonstration in my Aerod Mix video. I could not stand to have it in the soil. I just couldn't because as I said, when I was making that video, I could actually see gnats. I could see fungus gnats flying in my house. I haven't seen a gnat in my house in over a year, not since I started using semi-hydroponics. So this plant is now living in Lekka, as you can see, as it rightly should. And my ethos is to grow my plants in soil. If I can't grow a plant in Lekka, I just won't have it, period or I need to find a way to make sure that I can grow it in Lekka. So it's not about the plant not being able to grow in Lekka. I see that as I don't have enough information to provide the condition that this plant needs in this medium. So it's never the plant, it's always user error. So yeah, it's, 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 I'm, I'm, all, I'm all in, 100% Lekka for me, and I am striving to do that. And as the Lekka queen, it really doesn't make sense if I've got plants living in soil now, does it? So yeah, Lekka 100% all the way and I hope you stay with me for this journey. So I think that is all the questions that I had for this week. Thank you so much for sending in all those questions. Thank you so much for watching all the way up to the end and I will put up uh, the Q&A post. It will be going up on Monday and it will stay on and I will try and respond to 
all the questions that are asked on that platform on a video like this and please I'd love to hear your feedback on whether this works for you or not and what else you can suggest uh, so yeah please leave your comments down below again thank you for watching please don't forget to like share and subscribe and I will see you in my next video thanks bye